Hey everybody, welcome. Pastor Corey here with Court Street Christian Church. I'm excited to share another uh, worship service with you today. And uh, we're in our series, Learning Along the Way. And uh, this is a sermon series that have been inspired by what I've been learning along the way, especially from a recent uh, pastoral break that I got to be a part of. And so we've been enjoying going through this. It's been highly applicable. I've been hearing good things from you. Uh, I love it, by the way, when you reach out and you tell me how the sermon series is affecting you and just how it's sinking into your life. That is stuff that gets this pastoral heart super excited. So uh, keep doing that and uh, let's jump right into this one today. So um, out at the property where I got to move a little over a year ago, uh, I've always been a city dweller, always lived here in Salem, in fact, um, uh, but uh, last year we had the opportunity to move out to a couple of acres out between here and Jefferson. And um, on, this, on this little two acres, there is a ton of trees, some huge oak trees, some big old fir trees. I mean, they're just really just amazing trees. And as we've been getting to know the property, uh, what we've realized is a few of these trees were actually problem trees. And so we had, to, uh, we had to schedule to have them taken down. Here's a picture of one of the bigger ones. I actually had a, a tree company come out, and they identified the ones that they were like, you know, that one's leaning over your house. That tree, you might not realize it. It's already dead, but it doesn't know it yet, and you don't know it yet, but it's going to be a problem. This one here, fir trees aren't supposed to have this fork in them. Apparently, when they do, they always rot right there, and so they're like, we just got to take these things down. Well, they did, and uh, when they took the trees down, here's a picture of one of the guys up on the trees here doing it. You know, I actually made a day of this, and a buddy actually came over because he just wanted to hear it. The smell of, uh, you know, wood and, and, you know, small gasoline engine rah, rah, was in the air, and it was just kind of this amazing experience to see this, these mighty trees that, uh, that had become a threat uh, taken down. And... Um, uh, it, uh, it actually created an amazing amount of wood, too. Here's my, my driveway before, and uh, you can see all this space here. That's just a, a portion of the driveway, but you can see what it looks like afterwards here after they took these trees down, and uh, there's just wood everywhere, and that's not all of it. There's more up on the hill. There's more around the other side of the house, and, uh, and it created this big project because the guys would take the wood down, but then for them to fully process it, it costed a lot more money. And so they chopped it up into these little chunks and said, well, you can split it, have a nice day. And they took off. And so I spent a day getting into this. And in a day, I was able to split this big chunk that you see right here next to our, next to our farm truck. And um, what I rented to accomplish that was this big old uh, industrial log splitter. And it's one of these hydraulic ones where you stand it up and then you put the, uh, the round underneath it and pull the hydraulic lever and it splits right through it. And some of these rounds, as you can see right here, they're just massive. In fact, if you stood them on their side, they'd come up to about here on me. And it was just little old modest me negotiating these big old rounds uh, all day in order to produ produce uh, that pile of wood there. Now, at the end of that, I was out there working for probably about five hours uh, on the machine in order to accomplish that. And it was a hot day. And I'll tell you what, I was covered in sweat. And when I went inside, you want to know what I did? Is I got a glass, I put some ice in it, and I got some good old H2O. And after you've been out there sweating, moving around logs like that, just in the stress, the joy, the beauty, the exertion of all of it, nothing quite satisfies like a nice ice-cold glass of water. Oh yeah, it's good when you're preaching too. Water, get yourself some. Hit the pause button. Treat yourself, huh? You know, um, I remember that day when I came in and I took that drink of water and I just started gulping it. I could literally feel it going through my body and like refreshing and replenishing it. It was amazing. The reason that I bring this up is that right now we are in a time, once again, of extreme anxiety and agitation as a society. And right now people are desperate for a refreshing drink of something cool like water. And I want to talk about what that would look like for us. 
us, you and me, to get a vision for how we could be this refreshment to people who are experiencing so much uncertainty, so much hurt, and so much anger right now. And anger is a big word. In fact, I want to talk about anger today and how much of it there is in our society. One of the biggest things that has been a recent provocateur of anger has been, wow, 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 wow. Here in Oregon, I don't know where you're watching this from, but we just got uh, handed the news this week that now these masks are required everywhere again, whenever you're indoors, and they're recommended for outdoors. And honestly, when I heard it, I was like, dang it, really? <laughs> We've come so far, and we had this, and then we lost this, and then we got it back, and now we're taking a step backwards, and we've got to wear the masks again. Some are angry uh, right now about that. Some are angry that the governor didn't act sooner. Some are angry about freedoms being taken away. Some people are feeling a lot of anger and agitation about school starting up. And there's this thing about masks in classrooms, and, and there's just a lot of anxiety around uh, kids getting back to school here in a few weeks. Some people are angry about the pressure that they're feeling in their jobs that has lasted and become worse throughout the pandemic. Some people are angry about the political party that's in power right now. Some people are really angry about the political party that was in power a few months ago. There's so much anger floating around, anger about injustice, anger about abuse of power. People are angry about being judged because of the actions of others. But just make no mistake, there's just a lot of agitation in the world. Or some people, you might kind of have your anger hidden in a, a tidier sounding word like disappointment or concern. Or it's just, that's just wrong. No, I'm not angry. I'm just saying that that's wrong and that's right. Whatever it is, we're feeling that bodily emotion of anger a lot right now. Well, there is a lot to be angry about, and I'm not going to just tell you, oh, everybody, just don't be angry and just, uh, you know, sing a little ditty and we'll all get on with it. Life's often more complex than that, and fortunately, we have a God who represents that it's more complex than that, a God that can relate to us even in the midst of very human emotions like anger. And I believe he's someone that we can trust with our anger. And uh, to get into this today, I want to start by looking at a scripture that, um, that this comes from Ephesians. This is Paul, a guy who, uh, who had a pretty powerful presence in the Bible. Um, and, uh, and he's somebody that strikes me as having, having a, a relationship with anger. He could get kind of fired up. He could get passionate sometimes and get cutting with his words. And he gives us this great advice in Ephesians chapter 4, he says, in your anger, do not sin. And there's some, there's some versions of the Bible, some translations of the Bible, like the King James Version, where what, it actually, what they actually translate it as is, be angry, yet do not sin. Maybe some of you grew up with, uh, with that translation. And so you felt like there's something in this scripture that actually gives you permission to be angry. In fact, sometimes we kind of like our anger and we try to figure out a way to justify it. And so we like, what do we like to do? We like to call it righteous anger, don't we? I don't get angry. I just get righteously angry. I only get angry about the things that God gets angry about. I only hate the people that God hates. And uh, this is a dangerous game to play, my friends, because while the Bible acknowledges anger as a part of the human experience in this life at least, what it always tells us is it always gives us some qualification like this. It, in your anger, don't sin. It doesn't say go out and get angry and then destroy a bunch of stuff because of it. You don't find that type of permission given by the scriptures. And so I want you to write this down. I'm going to give you three thoughts about anger and how it relates to kindness. Kindness is that cool drink that the world is, is aching for right now, I believe. And so I want you to get this. Being angry does not make me righteous. Anger and righteousness, there, there's often these warnings that it leads us away from righteousness. But what I do with my anger might actually be righteous. You see, our anger can actually agitate us to look at something differently and motivate us to get up and do something that actually could be righteous, okay? That's what we're going to look at. This week in my preparation for this sermon, I, uh, 
I was listening to an, another sermon that uh, Pastor Josh recommended me to. This was um, from a guest speaker that was at Southeast Christian Church back in Louisville, Kentucky. And I was just in Louisville recently, so I have a connection to the area. And, um, and uh, in this sermon, this, this Christian author and this Christian radio uh, personality, he, ha- he had this great quote. He said, I'm not going to be offended by humans being human anymore. <laughs> this is Brant Henson. I'm not going to be offended by humans being human anymore. You see what he's realized in kind of the impetus for his book called Unoffendable, how just one change can make your whole life better. You see, he's realized that Christians, we've really started to sort of have a lot of pride on this idea of righteous anger. But the Bible doesn't really associate those things except with with God, with Jesus and with God the Father. But when it comes to human anger, There's always this qualification. There's always these statements that say, be really careful in your anger. Don't sin. You're going to get angry, but it doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires. And so we've got to to look at these things for what they are. And that anger, while it's a powerful emotion, it can become very, very dangerous. And isn't it funny how as humans, we get so offended by humans being human, don't we? And then we say, oh, it's, it's my righteous indignation, or I'm just mad because God would be mad about it, or this kind of, kind of nonsense. But it's like, we're, it's like we're looking for things, we're looking for things to really be angry about. You know, I recently uh, drove up to Portland to have a, a meal with some family. And uh, on the, everybody that knows that takes the drive from Salem up to Portland, there's a certain place where you slow down, and there's traffic, isn't there? And that magical place is, it's Wilsonville. (laughs) There's always the Wilsonville slowdown, isn't it? And isn't it amazing that every time that I hit it, even though I've driven it so many times, I know it's going to be there. As soon as I come to it, I just get so angry and I get so agitated with the traffic. Why is it that I get so offended by humans being human? Why is it that I get so offended by traffic being traffic? Why is it that there's that person at work that every day you go in and you're almost like anticipating it? You're like, you know what? I know they're going to say this. And sure enough, they say it. And you're just so angry about it. You were thinking about it before. Then it happens and you're angry. And then afterwards, you're angry some more. And you just got this big buildup of anger. Or maybe it's somebody in your family. And that person, they just have this way of getting you angry and we're, we're looking at them or they do certain things that are just very human. They're forgetful or they're this or they're that. I love this. I'm just not going to be offended by humans being human anymore. You know, the thing I want to point out about this is if you're searching for ways to confirm your anger, you will find it in this world. If you're looking for opportunities for kindness you will find those as well. You get to choose what you're looking for. And that leads me to my second thing about anger and kindness. I want you to get this. What I seek in life, I will find. If you're looking for things to agitate you more, if you're looking for things to be offended, if your nerve endings are dangling all over the floor and you want to call down the fires of heaven about it, you'll have no shortage, I guarantee it. And if you're looking for kindness and opportunities to dispense God's goodness into the world, you will find those as well. You know, the Bible's uh, got some great wisdom of this. You know, this last week we were... um, we're looking at Jesus and uh, an interaction that he had, very powerful interaction at his last meal that he was going to have on earth. It's called, you know, the Last Supper. And after this meal, after he washes his feet, which are the disciples' feet, which we talked about last week, he goes into just some final instructions and some final teachings for them. And he doesn't say, I, just good news, you know, now that you guys signed up for my program, nobody's ever going to offend you. You're never going to be angry. You're never going to get hurt. You're going to walk between the raindrops. No, what he actually says to them in his final moments is he's predicting his own death, which is imminent. Look at what he says in John 16. He says, I've told you these things so that in, you, in me you may have peace. In this world, guess what? You will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Why do we get so offended by humans being human? Why do we get so angry when hardships or trouble come? I mean, I don't think we can look at them and smile and dance a jig, 
But aren't they to be expected? Didn't even the blessed Jesus live this out and tell us about it? But what's the comfort to us? Take heart. You're going to get lit up. Your anger, your pain grid, all this stuff, it's going to happen to you. You're going to experience hardship. But take heart. I have overcome the world. You know, the God that we're proclaiming here is is often not as much the God who's going to miracle us out of our circumstances, but it's the God that meets us in our circumstances. The God who, in the form of Jesus, has walked through every bit of it. And his spirit within us goes with us through everything. And we grow through that. We grow through the hardships. And that God has promised in this life that's going to be. In the next life, things will be different. This is our opportunity. This is our opportunity to see a miracle where things that agitate us actually could become an opportunity for kindness. I don't believe in the next life we'll have anger. I don't believe in the next life that we'll have fear. I don't believe we'll have hardship. Things are going to be different. This is the only opportunity that we have to participate in that miracle that Jesus lived out. Well, it all sounds great, right? And uh, it's like, okay, Corey, I get it. I should do this, not that. I should, you know, okay, the anger, the kindness thing. But man, it's tough, isn't it? There's so many things in this world that get us agitated and they're personal. They're very personal and they're very offensive. And honestly, they're worth getting angry about and they're worth doing something about. But how we do it is the important thing. Let's look to the scripture here again. This is Paul. This is where um, that earlier one where we kind of, you know, pulled from earlier translations of the Bible, the permission uh, or even the the idea of we should be angry, but we just shouldn't sin. Let's, Let's see what it says in the full context here, okay? says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we all are all members of one body. Pause here for just a second. I want you to know something that there's oftentimes in anger this association between falsehood and anger. The truth kind of disappears when anger comes in and lights a fire and, and burns things down and burns bridges. I'll talk more about that in a minute, but just notice how it flows here. Speak truthfully, and then it says, in your anger, don't sin. In your anger, don't, don't blow it. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. See, anger, warning, warning, warning. Be careful with this stuff. Paul goes on to say this, anyone... Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer. More honesty stuff here about how you deal with each other. But must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. You hear now we're we're, uh, migrating from dishonesty to anger to kindness now to share with those in need. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And in our society, with the rhetoric that's been going on, take me back for a second here to that last screen, would you, Danny? Let me just say this again. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. Here's where I'll conclude this section of scripture here. It says this, and do not, give the whole, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of the bitterness. Get rid of the rage. Get rid of the anger, the brawling, the slander, along with every form of malice. Ah, the sip of water. Be kind. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So let me break this down for you. We're going to get real practical here, okay? Here's what I'm inviting you into is this anger and kindness deal. God can transform my biased anger into an honest kindness. He can do this miracle where my agitation can actually get me up and it can activate me then for some kind of good work from God and honest kindness in the world. You may be going, Corey, why'd you choose these words right here? Well, the reason is because If you think about the things you get angry about, they're oftentimes biased, aren't they? 
They affirm some worldview that I have or some political party that I'm cheering on or something that I just think should be changed out there. It's oftentimes our anger kind of gravitates around this bias or we see certain people and we've decided that they're on the inside and others are on the outside and so I'm angry with this group, against this group, without actually stepping in honestly and connecting with people and doing and participating in some kindness. So three, three thoughts here for what this looks like. Three steps. Very practical I'm going to be today with you, okay? This is, this, this is interruptive for your anger. Hopefully it is. It's, it's been interruptive for mine. The first thing is this. You've got to acknowledge your anger to God. What's that called? When we're just talking with God, there's a word, starts with a P, ends with a rare prayer, right? <laughs> That's exactly it, huh? We've got to just talk to God and acknowledge our anger. Guess what? He already knows that you're upset. He already knows the things that you've thought, the things that you've plotted, the, the prayers that you haven't said out your mouth to him with your hands folded, but you've said kind of in your heart, I hope they get theirs, and all this kind of, all this kind of vindictive business. You know, we don't have to look further than the intense honesty of the Psalms in the Bible, where we hear people getting so agitated and bringing it to God that they're even talking about wishing that people's kids would suffer. I mean, that's intense anger. And God meets people in that. But we've got to acknowledge it before him. True confession. Okay, I want you to raise your hand if this is true for you. Okay, and we'll do this here on Sunday at church also. We're going to do mass confessional. How many of you are better and quicker to acknowledge your anger before people than you are to God? Eh, me. I'm more often to call up somebody and be like, I can't believe about this, or blah, 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 or to fire off some text to somebody than I am to stop and just pray about it and to acknowledge it before God. If you want to grow in this, you're going to have to put in the work, and the first step is prayer. In prayer, that leads us to this. We've acknowledged our anger. We've been honest about it. We don't need to be dishonest and clean it up with God. He'll help us. He'll meet us in it, because what we're going to ask God for is we're going to ask him for his perspective which that Ephesian scripture, I want you to go back and look at that this week, it was so rich with God's perspective and with our reality. And there's this, there's this shift that happens when I'm focused on my anger, focused on the offender, when I connect with the idea of forgiving others as God has forgiven me. Oh my goodness, I've been forgiven for so much. How is it that I could look at this person and want to pray vindictive prayers over them for what they've done when I've received so much grace and goodness from God and forgiveness. And so our prayers start to give us a different perspective. And then what that lends itself to is it lends to God giving us wisdom. What is the kind thing to do? Not the dishonestly kind thing to do, but what is the honestly kind thing to do? And so that's the third thing. Through that process, you'll get to a place where you get to do something. If all your anger is is just anger that begets anger and you're just sitting on it and rehearsing it before God, before people or whatever, that's no good. Eventually, it's got to go through this process and be activated to you actually doing something. That's when you go, I see the injustice and it's motivated me, and I've gotten close, I've prayed with God about what to do, now I know it's mine to do that's going to add not destruction into the world, but it's going to build something. It's going to build something through the honest kindness of God into the world. So, I, um, on my time out, uh, I had some, uh, I had some, Amazing times, which I've been sharing about with about you, um, sharing about with you. There we go. See if I can find my words today. Um, and uh, I also had some real difficulties during my time away on pastoral retreat. In fact, I had a, a two-week section of my time away where we had booked um, two weeks of family vacation and adventures. We were going to go to Vegas as a family, and uh, we were going to sit by a pool and see a couple shows and eat some great meals and and have a good time. And, um, and then we also had planned these little day adventures where we were going to grab some other family members and go to the coast and go clamming and then go over here and visit my grandparents. And, and uh, we had some, um, some family difficulty emerge that honestly it was, you know, in categories of storms, this was like a, storm, a category four or five. It was intense. 
It was so intense that the, all that vacation plans disappeared. They got swallowed up into the storm. The money that was spent on the, on the hotel wasn't refundable. All of it was lost. At one point, it was so bad that, uh, that my bride, Allison, looked at me as I was sitting in a chair, and she just goes, are you having a stroke? Because there was just something about the way I was sitting, and I just I couldn't move. I was just so overwhelmed by the difficulty of this, uh, of this personal storm that we were going through. And... Uh, one of, the, um, one of the people that was really meaningful to me through that storm, still is, is, um, is my brother. And uh, I've got a picture here of my brother. This is my brother, Dustin. And uh, uh, this is a picture of us after my 40th birthday. Uh, my family pulled some resources and they, they bought me a, a helicopter ride. I got to fly out of McMinnville and I got to fly around and see, flew over my house at the time. And I could take one person with me, and so I took Dustin and the pilot too. We're not qualified, but <laughs> but uh, we got to just have this amazing uh, experience. Dustin's just that that brother, you know. When you got to call somebody, you need somebody to just show up. Dustin does, and uh, he loves God. He loves his family, and we just have this great uh, energy between the two of us as brothers. And uh, in the midst of that, uh, in the midst of that difficulty that I was going through. And I was at my lowest, and Dustin knew it. He knew how much I was suffering. He knew how much anger, hurt, the whole thing was inside of my life. Uh, there was a day that he just, he pinged me with a text. And you'll have to have some grace for him in his language here, you know. But, um, but here's, here's what happened. He reaches out to me and he says, he's like, how are you doing? And here was my response. I just said, thanks for checking in. It seriously means a lot. Last night, I was feeling a lot of anger about everything, I'd spent a few days in hurt, sadness, and depression before that, and today I'm just feeling pretty empty, vulnerable, and helpless. I think I'm going to get out of town for a few days next week and just be away from everyone. I'm hoping for some healing and some peace to come in for me. I just said, the best thing you can do for me right now is just pray and reach out just like you did. I love you, brother. Peace. He texts me back and he says, emotions are a bleep edited for online viewing and for your sensitive ears. He says, emotions are a bleep to navigate alone, so just remember, you got backup if you need it. I understand wanting to have your alone time and your thoughts, but this isn't another deployment, soldier. Your family's here for you. Really sweet sentiment, really kind, right? And uh, exactly 11 minutes later, he sends me this. Actually, he says, I just found my balls. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> he says, what do you want for dinner? I'm coming over with some dinner, and I'm coming over with a couple of beers, and I'm going to see another sunset with you and talk with my brother. You know, him showing up that night in the midst of my anger and my despair, and him just being bold and not just talking about kindness, although that's important to have the words that go with it, but he acted on it. And in his, his presence that night actually had this effect on me where we waded through some of the storm with God together. And it started to get a little bit more clear. And the anger started to be relieved and the path of honest kindness started to be revealed. So my question for you, church, is this. What is it going to cost you this week? Because you're going to get provoked in your anger. It's all waiting for you out there. All the offenses, all the, all the people that just agitate you, the annoying people, everything, it's all going to be there. What's it going to cost you to hold on to your anger? And what would it cost you instead to choose kindness? You know the situations. You know the opportunities that are coming. And some of them are unknown. They're just going to pop up like a, like a surprise. And in that moment, I want you to think of this. What's it going to cost me if I hold on to my anger? Or what's it going to cost me to choose kindness instead? I love this scripture here. This is a, um, uh, a combination of a section from Romans chapter 12, verse 17 and 21. Paul, again, he's getting a lot of airtime today. Uh, says, don't repay anyone evil for evil. That's the angry cycle. You know what it does? Stirs up more anger. Stirs up more agitation. Stirs up more offenses. Don't repay anyone evil for evil, but overcome evil with good. Or for today's purposes, 
overcome evil with kindness. The world's agitated, my friends, and it's begging for a cool, refreshing drink of heavenly kindness. Will you be that for people this week? What will it cost you? I don't know, but God has done for you as he wants to bless you to do for others. Amen? Amen. I thought about uh, chugging the rest of this at the end of this sermon and spiking it on the floor Viking style and saying, another! (laughs) But uh, God have mercy on our custodial team, and I do too. But imagine the dramatic gesture, and now you go get another, and you serve it out there. May you be the kindness of Christ in whatever you experience this week. In Jesus' name, amen.